Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry for the slight technical delay, but uh, uh, today I'll be talking about optimally tuned brain-separated hybrid density functionals, which is a lot of adjectives, and I'll explain them as I go along. Uh, this talk is sort of semi-tutorial in the sense that it's very much a research talk that we're showing research results from my group, but uh, I chose not necessarily the latest ones, but rather ones that, you know, tell a clear story, I hope. At least. So before I start, let me just say thanks, first of all, to my group. This is a fairly recent group photo by the Sea of Galilee, and three of the group members are here, Georgia and Rachel and David and various funding agencies that have supported this work in the last 10 years or so. And with this, let's talk about the science. So, as you already heard from Hardy in one of his talks, there are two different gaps to think about. One is the fundamental gap, which is the difference between the ionization potential and the electron affinity. So it's the difference between two different single particle excitations. And then there's the optical gap, which is the minimum energy required to create single excitation. So in the language of quasi-particle theory, I create both a quasi-electron and a quasi-hole. And generally, the optical gap will be smaller than the fundamental gap because the electron and the hole attract each other. The difference can be small or large depending on the system. So that's one thing that we've already heard, just as a brief reminder. As yet another brief reminder, I already told you, and uh, Waita also discussed it in his talk, that the exact Consham gap may, is generally different than the fundamental gap because of this derivative discontinuity, and therefore Consham <coughs> eigenvalues don't mimic, mimic the quasi-particle picture even in principle. So how does this uh, manifest itself in practice? So here's one molecule, it's called H2TPP, it's really not so important for our purposes which molecule this is. The reason that I chose it is because there are good gas phase experimental data for the ionization potential, electron affinity, and also the optical gap in gray here. And there are also good reference um, any body perturbation theory data from this paper, so GW for the two quantities, and then GW BSC, so BSC, that Saltpeter equation is a two-particle green function formalism that gives you the option. So you see that it agrees fairly well with experiment, and fairly well means within about 0.1 or 0.2 ether. So what happens if you do a GGA? This happens to be PPE. So the time-dependent DFT for the optical gap is actually in great agreement with experiment. However, if you were to take epsilon homo and epsilon lumo seriously as the ionization potential and the electron affinity, which you shouldn't do, then A, it's way too small with respect to the experimental answer. B, the gap here is actually a little smaller than the optical gap, which means that if you take it seriously, you would conclude that electrons and holes repel each other. That's just sad, I guess. So what happens if we move to a hybrid functional? In this case, it's B3-lib. So the time-dependent DFT was OK and is OK. The eigenvalues are still way off even though this is already, as I told you yesterday, a generalized Consham scheme now. So in principle, why is the gap larger? Because some of the discontinuity is now not just in the kinetic energy operator, but also in the partial flock operator. So yes, the gap is larger, but it's not nearly large enough. So okay, electrons and holes don't repel each other anymore, but it's still far from satisfactory. So why is that? Well, I already told you that there's wiggle room if I uh, go to the generalized Consham theory, and I also told you why, but one has to choose wisely which generalized Consham theory one would use, which map. And here, I, we believe that the problem is that, look, if you're trying to describe how an electron goes out into infinity or comes back in from infinity, you better have the correct asymptotic potential which none of these functionals have, because to have the correct asymptotic potential, you would need 100% of Fock exchange, or full exact exchange. But if you have full exact exchange, as we've already heard, it's very hard to find a compatible correlation expression. So basically, now you're stuck in a classic how to have your take and eat it two situation. You can either retain full exact exchange, but do not so well on the correlation, or you can create a better balance between exchange and correlation, but then do poorly on the full exact exchange, and either way you're stuck. So the general solution to a how to have your cake and eat it to situation, 
in science as in life is to make sure that you have at least two separate cakes. And that really turns out to be the solution here. So the solution is to move to a so-called range-separated hybrid functional, which we have already told us about. So very briefly, we take the 1 over R Coulomb propulsion and we separate it into a short-range term and a long-range term. For example, with the help of the error function and the complementary error function, which is just 1 minus the error function. So as written, this is actually a fairly trivial identity. But now we do something with it. We say that, okay, in the long range, that's where the asymptotic potential lies. That's where it's important to emphasize exact exchange. So we'll treat this piece as if it's Hartree-Fock theory, which, remember, is part of DFT. In this piece, the short range, where it's really important to balance exchange and correlation, this will treat with our favorite GGA. If we do that, we get uh, a single particle equation that looks like this. So we have the usual kinetic ion and the hard return. But then we have long range Fock exchange. So Fock exchange only in the long range. GGA exchange only in the short range, and then the usual GGA equation. And this is not an idea that we came up with. Here are some previous papers that came up with this. And in general, the idea of a range-separated hybrid in this way can be traced back to Andreas. So now another thing that I told you is that you can't just toss around an orbital dependent expression and call it generalized Konchan theory. You have to show which map you're using. And I also told you that from this perspective, a hybrid functional is not really hybrid. So let me show you that that's the case also here. So here's again this S functional that I was emphasizing throughout yesterday. This time I chose two, uh, I'm sorry, T plus the long range part of the electron electron repulsion. Then my OS operator is same as yesterday, the kinetic energy plus just the long range hard re part and just the long range fog part. So then what do I choose as an approximation for the remainder potential? Well, the complementary short range part of the hard return, short range GGA, and the usual correlation. And this is an act that we suggested in this paper. And if you do that, you're right back to the equation that I just showed you. So yes, it's absolutely within the generalized Konsham uh, formalism and therefore theoretically justified. May or may not be a good approximation, but a, a theoretically justified approximation. Now, there's one point here that I haven't discussed so far. And OK, but how do I choose the range separation? Or in other words, what's this gamma parameter here? which really sort of sets where I would be transitioning from a long-range behavior to a short-range behavior, or vice versa. So there are two ways to go about it, one of which is the semi-empirical, or the fitting, as, as John called it, with a pH. And that was basically the approach adopted in, in this article, where they took some data set, depending on the article, and they fit and they came up with the best overall compromise gamma. That's OK. There's nothing wrong with it. We wanted to do something else for two reasons. First, because we wanted to keep it first principles, and also for another reason that I'll touch upon in a little later. So what did we do? So this is uh, actually joint work with a group of Roy Bear at the Hebrew University, and Tamar Stein was uh, the student pushing this. And our idea of choosing gamma was to say that, OK, instead of a one-size-fits-all uh, fit, for any system that we care about, let's enforce the ionization potential theorem. And this is in the spirit of enforcing constraints uh, uh, that uh, Mel emphasized in so did John. So this is a known constraint. The exact function I should obey that minus epsilon homo is the difference in total energies between the cation and the neutron. Now, for any choice of gamma, I can go ahead, solve the equations, and therefore calculate the left-hand side. I can equally well take this total energy difference and calculate the right-hand side. And then I can ask myself, are the two the same or not? And if they're not the same, I can keep looking. Now, ideally, I want to do that also for the LUMO, but there is no such theorem for the LUMO on account of this derivative discontinuity business. So therefore, I'm going to demand this once again, but not on the LUMO, rather on the HOMO of the anion. So I have two conditions, only one variable. So I can choose to minimize it and say in a least square sense, or a sum of absolute values or whatever. Now, the good news is that this way I can determine gamma for each system. The bad news is that it's for each system, which means that it's no longer a universal value. It may become system dependent. And in fact, it does. But the point that I can't emphasize enough is that while we're therefore tuning this range separation parameter, we're not fitting it to anything. 
This is not an empirical uh, procedure. We do not require information from experiment or from, say, wave function theory. This is just demanding self-consistency within a DFT constraint. How does that work in practice? So here's an example with our uh, PET molecule here. So here's this J target function as a function of gamma, the range separation parameter. The first term in red is the enforcement of the condition on the uh, neutral system. And you can see that, yes, it drops to a minimum, which is actually zero. The green is the same for the anion. It's actually pretty close. And if I do sum of absolutes, in this case, I have this blue curve. And I can pick a, a winner. This is my optimal gamma. And now I freeze it, and it is never to be touched again for this particular system. Uh, is that a, uh, the absolute value? That's the absolute value, yeah. So something changes. Changes sign, sure, absolutely. If I do that, then lo and behold, now the ionization potential and the electron affinity are both fine, so the gap is fine. It's within 0.1 UV from uh, uh, experiment. And at the same time, the optical gap is as good or maybe even slightly better than it was before. So this is the OTRSH approach for optimally tuned range-separated hybrid. And to the best of my knowledge, this was the first method that was capable of capturing the single uh, particle excitation and the two particle excitation in one consistent uh, DFT frame. Now, you could say, well, that's well and nice. At least I hope you're saying that that's well and nice, but that's one molecule. So let me show you a somewhat more comprehensive set. So this is uh, work done in collaboration with uh, Jeff Neaton at the University of California at Berkeley. This was a co-production of Sivan Rafael Abramson, who was my student, and Isaac Templin, who was Jeff's postdoc. And now we went over all 148 molecules in the G2 set, which is actually the original set of molecules used to fit B3 lip. And this is minus epsilon homo versus the experimental ionization energy. So if the theory is good, and for that matter the experiment also, then one would expect to sit on the straight line. So you see that despite giving B3-lip the home field advantage, as it were, it's still not doing very well. It's not obeying the ionization potential theorem consistently. Whereas our approach is doing much, much better. And uh, the second... Uh, uh, graph here just shows that this does not come at the cost of calculating bond lengths. The bond lengths agree just as well between the two calculations. Let me give you one more example where this helps, and that's the charge transfer excitation problem. So to see why this would be an issue, consider Mollikan's limit. Mollikan uh, uh, realized already in the 50s that if I have a donor and an acceptor that are well separated and I take an electron from here to there, then the minimum energy for charge transfer is the ionization potential of the donor, so I liberate the electron. I get back the electron affinity of the acceptor by depositing the electron on the other side. And then I also gain some energy in the form of a 1 over R Coulomb attraction between the electron that is now here and the hole that was left behind there. Fine. So now suppose that I do time-dependent DFT in the linear response as we've heard about from, from Hardy and from Newton. And this is in the adiabatic expression, so no memory effects. One can work out the limit, and it turns out to be epsilon homo of the donor minus epsilon lumo of the acceptor. And if it's a hybrid function, I'll also minus A over R, where A is the fraction of Fock exchange. So now compare the two expressions and realize that in a standard functional, epsilon homo is not the ionization potential, epsilon lumo is not the electron affinity, and A is not 1. So in other words, the first term is wrong, the second term is wrong, the third term is wrong, but otherwise everything is fine. So clearly we have a problem, but I hope that I have convinced you that in our approach, epsilon homo will be the ionization potential, epsilon homo will be the electron affinity, and A in the long range is 1 by definition on account of having full Fock exchanges synthetic. So, will that work also at practical distances? Well, yes. It's a table, so let's go over it slowly. These are experimental data, donor-acceptor pairs in, uh, in uh, the gas phase. The acceptor is tetracyanoethylene, and the donors are simple aromatic molecules, benzene, toluene, etc. And these are the experimentally obtained numbers. Here's time-dependent PBE, way off, overestimating by more than two electrons. 
time-dependent B thrillet, which is, let's say, almost the default functional in organic chemistry, only marginally better. BNL is a type of arranged-separated hybrid. If I use a fixed parameter, which was actually fit against thermochemistry in Roy Bear's group, it's somewhat better, but now it's overestimated. If I do this optimal tuning trick, I'm in business. So you see that it also makes this problem go away. And by the way, after we published it, Karsten Tigerson's group said, well, if they can do it with TBDFT, why can't we do it with PWBSC, which is correct. So they did, and the result is almost as good, which is why it's in orange here, but not quite. And Xavier Blas later that year put this to rest by doing a trick called partial self-consistency in the, in the GW calculation. So that's what I'm fine. Of course you can do it with many body perturbation theory. But I will dare say that I think that this was the first time the time-dependent AFT was used to benchmark many body perturbation theory and not the other way around. Yes? Uh, when you were showing the theory, mm -hmm. it was the I and the A of the total system. Yes. And here, in, in this form, it's the I, one is the donor, and one is the acceptor. Are you right. saying that it gets that? Right. It gets that right because in this case it happens to be close. In other words, the ionization is dominated by the donor and the electron affinity is dominated by the acceptor. So if you do it together or separately, it's both. We did, actually did that. And do you know if it keeps working as you sort of reduce the distance? Yes, so this is not at an asymptotic distance. This is at a realistic optimized distance. That's the whole point. Thanks for mentioning. That's not just the asymptotic regime. The asymptotic regime works by definition, but this is beyond that. Now, there's a myth which I would like to dispel here, is, and that is that, okay, you gain four charge transfer excitations that way, but then you lose on valence excitations. So here's work from the Auschwitz group. They took 40 uh, pi conjugated dyes, calculated the zero, zero excitation energies, compared them to benchmark data. And you can see that if you're using untuned range-separated hybrids, then yes, it gets somewhat worse, especially with LCPBE. But if you tune it, you're actually not only doing as well as B3LIP or PBE0, but in fact just a tad better. So this does not come at the cost of valence excitations, which is something that we even pointed out a bit earlier on a much more limited uh, data set uh, in this article. So now, that I hopefully convince you that that kind of works, let's dig a little bit deeper into what makes it work. So one thing that we noticed, and for fairness, again, the Auschwitz group noticed the about, about the same thing at about the same time. So let me focus on this. This is the H2O molecule. And I'm plotting this piecewise linearity curve, right, where in the ideal functional I should have uh, uh, basically a linear curve between the N minus 1 particle situation and the N particle situation. So what do I see? I see that when gamma goes to zero, which is basically the GGA limit, I have the usual convexity. When gamma goes to infinity, which is basically hard reform plus semi-local correlation, I have the usual concavity of hard reform. But when I optimize the range separation parameter, in fact, the curvature vanishes almost entirely to within point one. And I would like to emphasize that this is not a coincidence. Now, how do I know that? Because we can ask, and that's a question that Roy and I asked with numerical help from Jochen and from Neil Gobin. Again, all this was left by Tamar Stein again. Said, well, we know that if this is the exact picture that I already showed you, then typically it can be either convex or concave. In this case, I'm showing the convex behavior. So why is that? You can think about it philosophically in the following way. If the derivative discontinuity is missing, but the total energy is, this, is still OK, it's the same as taking a piece of rope and saying that, well, I still have to nail this piece of rope in here, here, and here. But I don't allow the rope to take the right angle here because there's not enough of a derivative discontinuity. So the only way you can solve this uh, uh, geometrical quandary is by letting the rope have some slack. And that's the curvature. Now, this is not just a hand-waving argument. In fact, this is a completely quantitative argument. And in fact, we were able to show that the curvature and the missing derivative discontinuities are doppelganger of each other, which is an, uh, an expression I, uh, we stole from one of uh, John Perdue's articles where he used it in a different context. So I'm not going to go over all the proof, but it's really simple. The point is that if there is curvature, then energy as a function of the number of particles 
is a linear term plus a curvature term, so a, a quadratic term. And then you can always evaluate where epsilon homo is by using Yamak's theorem, so derivative with respect to the fraction. And then you get total energy differences plus half the curvature. And it's the same for the loom also, with which I'm skipping over now. If you add these two up, you find that the fundamental gap or the ionization potential difference between neutral and anion is the Cohn-Sham gap plus half the curvature. But before that, we had the same, only instead of with plus half the curvature, we had plus the exchange correlation discontinuity, the derivative discontinuity. So they're really one and the same. You can't have one without the other. Just to show you that that works, here's PPE as an example. So two systems, fluorine 2 and anthracene. If I just look at the eigenvalue of the HOMO or the LUMO of the cation, they're too high or too low, respectively. Then I calculate the curvature, or rather Tamar calculated the curvature. Then I add this half the curvature correction. And presto, I'm within 0.1 EV from the correct result as obtained from total energy differences. So the traditional point of view was that the derivative discontinuity, or rather the absence of it, and this curvature are two separate but somewhat related bugs. From our point of view, the derivative, missing derivative discontinuity really is a bug. Curvature is a feature. It's there to compensate for this missing derivative discontinuity. Now, very quickly, the same. I already told you that Hartley-Fock theory is a special case of DFT. So just to underscore this, same thing also with Hartley-Fock theory except that now the HOMO is to, and the HOMO and the LUMO are uh, different with respect to the right answer because now the gaps are too large instead of too small. So that's actually why Hartree-Fock theory would be uh, concave instead of convex. Okay, now, why is the derivative discontinuity missing? So that brings us to the work of Eli Chrysler, who at that time was uh, a PhD student in my book. He's now a postdoc in Hardy's group, actually. And Ellie noticed the following. He went back to think about ensemble states, which I told you about, and he said, hey, if the original system is in an ensemble state because we have a fractional number of electrons, then so must the Cohn-Sham system be, which means that I can write it as an ensemble state, which means that now if I do the trace over the operator, etc., and I follow the algebra carefully, one can conclude that from an ensemble point of view, if you're in a fractional state, the total energy should really be written as 1 minus alpha times the Hartree exchange energy for row 0, plus alpha times the Hartree exchange correlation energy for row 1, where row 0 and row 1 are the densities with the fractionally filled state completely empty or completely full, respectively. Now, that's not what's typically done in those convexity plots that I showed you. What's typically done is that we have our favorite functional, LDA, GGA, hybrid, whatever, and we always stick the density in the same formula whether uh, if there's a fractional density or not. Here it actually says, well, don't do that. First put in the two densities from the Cohn-Sham calculation, then do the linear mixing and not the other way around. It's still from one self-consistent calculation because these densities both come from a single Cohn-Sham calculation. If we do that, obviously I skipped over a bunch of algebra, but in, it's in those two papers that are written down here. What do we get? So here's H2. This is the typical convex situation. So this is what we wanted to get, but the red line is what we do get. If we employ this ensemble correction in an OEP framework, which I'll tell you about OEP, this is what we get. It's not perfect, but hey, it's a lot better. Most of the curvature is gone. Same thing for the carbon atom. And if we look at this from an orbital point of view, we take the derivative, so this is epsilon homo as a function of the number of particles for this H2 system. Again, in the ideal case, remember that I told you yesterday that it should be a staircase. Now that's a fairly crooked staircase. You don't want to walk on a staircase like that. But if you do this, this ensemble correction, again, not perfect, but hey, much better. And this is still LDA. This is nothing or LSDA to be precise. No climbing up Jacob's ladder. This is still the lowest rung. And already much of the problem has been removed because these are the original eigenvalues, but then we have correction terms. Still, in the OTRSH approach, in the optimal tuned approach, the eigenvalues are exactly uh, the required result. So before I go on, let me make one more statement about that, and that is, sorry, that from this point of view, 
This curvature that LDA develops, again, is not really a bug. It's a defense mechanism against, against the theft of its derivative discontinuity by the absence of, a, of an ensemble truth. So it's, that's how it's protecting itself from that. Okay, so with this in mind, let's go back to the optimally tuned grain separated hybrid formalism. How am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay. Fine. Seven out of eight. Okay. So more recently, we've taken to using a more generalized optimally tuned range separated hybrid formalism, where we split the one over uh, operator in a slightly more general way, where in addition to this error, error function that we had before, we're also adding these alpha plus beta uh, coefficients. So now we have three coefficients aptly named alpha, beta, and gamma instead of just one. What does that buy us? First of all, it's really if we still want to make sure that the asymptotics are correct, so full asymptotic flow exchange, that's easy. All we have to do is make sure that the sum of alpha plus beta are one. And we can always refer to the previous form by setting alpha to zero and beta to one. But if alpha is a finite fraction, typically 20 to 25 percent, just like in a standard hybrid functional and a global hybrid functional, then basically what this does is it may, tends to mitigate self-interaction errors for the same reason exactly that, that the global hybrid functional mitigates self-interaction errors. It's introduction of some fault exchange in the short range. We suggested it in this paper, but let me show you a slightly more recent example of, uh, of how it works in practice for predicting for emission spectroscopy. Before I show an example, let me also tell you that Georgia Prokofiev has a, a poster on this here, and if you want to see an example of how this is applied to a very non-trivial molecule, which is cobalt ferrocyanate, and it's not too late to visit her post. I'll show you a different example now, which we did a little earlier. That's quinacridone. Quinacridone is this molecule. And it too, because of these groups here, offers opportunity for some orbitals to localize. And so it has a, a significant self-interaction error coming from these orbitals. So this is uh, uh, work done with these gentlemen from Graz in Austria. So Daniel came to our group as a visiting student and did the work. Mike did the experiments, and Peter is, is Daniel's advisor. So watch what happens. This is uh, photo emission spectroscopy that uh, the party was telling you about. So this is experiment. Okay. Here's PB. Doesn't agree with experiment that well. That I don't show it here, but it can be shown that that's due to self-interaction errors. So we do GW on top of that, as a, with this as a starting point, do GW, one shot GW correction. Actually not that great either. Why? The starting point has such a large self-interaction error that GW can shake it off, not completely. If we do HSC, it's actually in much better agreement with experiment, and then GW on top of that only changes things more. Fine. But what happens with this OTRSH? So here's OTRSH with this finite fraction of alpha, 25%, as in PBE0. And you see that it basically mimics GW perfectly. But this is BFD. What's more, if I uh, forget the fact that I have to compensate self-interaction errors and choose, foolishly choose, alpha equals 0 as before, then surprisingly I get something that is almost indistinguishable from the bad GW result. So with this formalism, I can mimic a good GW result, which is, of course, what I wish to mimic. But surprisingly, I can even mimic a bad GW result. And of course, uh, I'm not using the GW data. So this really is predictive. I could have said that even if we didn't do the GW calculation in there. Now, the last uh, point I would like to mention here is that this is the role that alpha can play. What about beta? Does it play any role other than being 1 minus alpha? So the answer is yes, sometimes. And to understand why, let's look at molecular solids. One aspect of molecular solids is that if I take a bunch of mole identical molecules and pack them into a molecular solid, the gap will shrink and will shrink substantially so even if the molecules interact only very weakly, say, uh, only by uh, Van der Waals interactions that you've heard about from Andrew. Why is that? It's basically a dielectric response issue. So let's start with the electron affinity. Suppose I bring an electron in. So the dielectric response creates an image hole 
the electron is now further attracted to this image hole, so I gain even more energy. Likewise, if I create a hole, then I create an image electron. The electron that's leaving is further repelled from this image electron, so it actually takes less energy to kick it out. So the ionization potential goes up, the electron affinity comes down, overall the gap shrinks. Now, GW can handle the dielectric response, so GW should be able to do that, and indeed it does. These are calculations of Sahar Sharif Zadeh, who at the time was a postdoc working uh, with Jeff Neaton and with me. So here's benzene, pentacene, C60, molecule on the left, solid on the right, and you can see that the gap shrinks in GW just like it should. You can see that it's a substantial effect, could be up to a few volts, or a few electron volts, and okay. What does DFT do? Well, here's PB HSC, PB zero. To summarize what uh, uh, DFT does for this renormalization effect in one word, nothing. Nothing is happening. The gap isn't changing from the molecule to the salt. Well, why is that? Why are we missing out? Because think about it, we're really demanding something very difficult from our density functional. We are demanding epsilon homo to change. It should, because in the exact functional, epsilon homo should mimic the ion, should be equal to the ionization potential. But hey, we're asking epsilon homo to respond to the removal of an electron that hasn't been removed yet. Because this is a calculation of just the neutral system. This is really difficult, which means that this has got to be a really subtle correlation effect, which none of these functionals have. And for that matter, if I did OTRSH, it's equal, which we did, it's not on this slide, it's equally blind to it. So how can we solve this? Well, this brings the concept of the optimally tuned screen brain separated hybrid. Remember that before we insisted that the asymptotic response be 1 over R, asymptotic potential. But in a solid, the asymptotic potential should really be 1 over epsilon R. So why don't we now insist that instead of alpha plus beta equals 1, we'll insist on alpha plus beta equals 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is the scalar dielectric constant. So we'll leave alpha and gamma precisely as we tuned them for the molecular system, because the molecular electronic structure really has barely changed. So whatever we found was good and remains good. Let's just change beta from 1 to 1 over epsilon, from 1 minus alpha to 1 over epsilon minus. What happens if we do that? First of all, now we have this renormalization even from density function. And it's in an excellent quantitative agreement with GW. Where did you get the so you can get it from a variety of places. In this case, it's from an RPA calculation. Why? Because the RPA calculation is part of the GW construction, so we wanted to make sure we we're comparing apples and apples by using the same epsilon. Of course, that's an expensive way of getting epsilon. There are also less expensive ways of getting epsilon. It's an auxiliary calculation, but it's still from first principles in the sense that it's based on the same, uh, same density. Okay, last but not least, what happens if I have an arbitrary solid, not a molecular solid, but an ionic solid or a covalent solid or a mixture of both? So Weitau already emphasized, and that's actually a very important point, that in the bulk limit, the ionization potential theorem is obeyed trivially, even with LDA. So on the one hand, it's nice to obey the theorem. On the other hand, if everyone's a winner, then you have no reason to choose one parameter over another, which is something that, that Weitau's group realized early on. We came back to that from various other perspectives in, in these two articles. But the point is that you can't tune in the way that we did, because everyone's a winner. So, we believe that in the long run we will be able to shake that problem off. We have some ideas of how to determine it from other means. But in what I will show you next, we just fit one parameter. So now this is the one and only place in this entire talk which, where we use the fitting parameter. We fit to the GW gap. So this is in the spirit of, of uh, John's uh, fitting parameter, but only one parameter, not 47. Or the point that we ask, then of course we get the correct gap by, by definition, that's trivial. But the question is, is the rest of the band structure okay? And more importantly, in the optical, is the optical absorption okay? Because as you may know, 
getting optical absorption in a solid from time-dependent DFT is hard. Actually, Nipa has a review article about this from last year, which explains this very, very nicely, among other things that it discusses. So does that work? Well, here's the answer. So silicon on the left, lithium fluoride on the right. Let me focus on lithium fluoride because I think it's a more dramatic case. So first of all, here's the band structure. Uh, red is the GW data. Black is this time is the, is the screen range separated hybrid from the time independent equation. And as you can see, it agrees very well over a wide range of energies. Uh, LDA is in, in this uh, gray line, so you see that the LDA is not doing that well. That's to be expected. More interesting is what happens for the optical absorption. So this is time dependent DFT. Let's start with experiment in blue. Experiment says that there's a sharp excitonic peak at 12 point something EV and basically nothing before that. And then there's another secondary. GWBSC, so many body perturbation theory, basically says the same thing. It agrees with experiment quite nicely, I would say. Time dependent LDA, on the other hand, is a mess. The oscillator strength is all over the place. There is no peak whatsoever where the excitonic peak should be. And basically, agreement between theory and experiment can be characterized as non-existent. But with this time-dependent screen range separated hybrid approach, you see that the peak is where it should be, the secondary peak is where it should be, and pretty much everything's OK. And again, the same for silicon. It's not as dramatic of an effect, but again, the band structure is fine, and this incorrect shoulder that the LDA predicts is actually gone and instead the right line shape is, is uh, okay. And finally, this is a very recent example, a collaboration uh, with the group of Jean-Luc Mada. David Egger was a postdoc in the group until very recently. Zilong Zheng is a postdoc with, with uh, Jean-Luc and, and Slava Krops Anu. So we went back to charge transfer excitations, but now in a molecular solid, so one before last slide. <laughs> And you can see that now the gas phase numbers overestimate experiment quite substantially. Why so? Again, because of the dielectric screening. And if you put that in, you're back within the experimental window. So that's the power of this data parameter. It's a way to control the dielectric screening, again, in a non-empirical fashion. And this brings me to my very last slide. So I don't want to create the impression that this approach can do anything but make coffee. That's just not true. There are many limitations as well. We can discuss them if you ask me about it now in the questions and answers. However, while there is still very much left to do, I would say that the traditional point of view is that DFT cannot quantitatively predict molecular gaps, charge transfer excitation energies, photoemission spectra, gap renormalization, and excitonic line shapes in solids and at least in standard forms, and I hope that by showing you at least one example from each, I was able to convince you that at least under some circumstances, maybe we can take away the moment. <laughs> so with this, I will stop, and thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Okay, yes? Uh, regarding the speed of Computation, how good is it because you are comparing various functions and, and, and the various methods. So, um, time is, is the one thing that we're always interested in because the computation time needs to be as less as possible. That's right. So, that's what John called it the right price. Yeah. Right? So, so, that's an excellent question. I would say this uh, a range separated hybrid, let's say, let's set the optimal tuning aside for a second. If I just do a range separated hybrid, say for a molecule, it's as expensive or as cheap, depending on your point of view, as a standard hybrid. Because I still have to evaluate the FOC operator, no more, no less. The optimal tuning means that I have to do a few of those because I need to change gamma several times before I find the optimal value. So that's just a linear scale, right? That doesn't change the fundamental scaling of the computation. It just means that I have to do a few instead of one. Uh, now. So, so basically, it's not uh, fundamentally more expensive than a hybrid function. Well, of course, that's also true for the solid, where a hybrid is, in general, more expensive, depending on what exactly you do. But again, it's as expensive or inexpensive as a hybrid, as a conventional hybrid function. Mm -hmm. Why should I uh, prefer one over the other if, if, if I have to choose between the methods? Because if we agree that it's for the same cost as a hybrid function, well, then for many cases, it gives you much better accuracy. 
So that's the part. That's the part of uh, of John's statement about the right answer. Yeah. Hopefully, also for the right reason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Well, I have a question regarding the particle energy of the homo minus. Uh, as we discussed uh, two days ago, mm -hmm. basically the answer is that if you get homo right, then you get everything right. But is there some physical justification for that? I couldn't find any because there, I did theory in whole exactly only for the homo energy. Right. Excellent point. Thank you for asking this. Uh, and here is the, went back to the slide where I can discuss it. So first of all, you're absolutely right. Rigorously, the ionization potential theorem get, tells us what epsilon homo is. Doesn't tell us anything about epsilon homo minus one, minus two, etc. Now, in fact, one can prove for the original Consham system, and it's not so difficult to generalize to a generalized Consham system too, that there is no rigorous equivalence between the spectral properties of the fictitious system and the spectral properties of the original system. In fact. Uh, Sham and Kahn had a paper on that in 1966. That's the Sham and Kahn paper as opposed to the Kahn and Sham paper. And one thing I learned from Kiron is that this Sham and Kahn paper is a very highly cited paper, which almost no one read, because if you go and look at the citations, you realize very quickly that most of them are from people that wanted to cite the Kahn and Sham paper, but got the wrong article. <laughs> right. So, going back to the point here, so, it's, there is no exact equivalence. However, since we are using a non-local operator, one can show that the fact, and, and again, there are analytical arguments to support that, the fact that it's not exactly the same is not synonymous with it being worthless. In fact, you can think of it, and one can show that this is the case, this is a low order approximation of what you would get with a proper self-energy operator. So now you have to ask a more subtle question, and that is, is the low order approximation good enough or not? Our general experience with this, at least for in the systems that we have studied so far, is that the, for the first few EV away from the gap, the agreement with GW is pretty good. Then it starts deteriorating, and I suppose that this de deterioration is partly a DFT issue, which I just mentioned, and maybe partly also a GW issue, because that has its own issues as you go to deeper and deeper energies. Then I would say that, yeah, the first few EV are good, and then gradually some discrepancy opens up. Yeah, so, so there are definitely also, it's maybe too long of an answer for now, but I can explain later, I can also give you references of why we actually ex expect it to deteriorate the further away we go from the HOMO. It's actually a very nice uh, argument due to Gunnarsson. In, in this regard. Kira, uh, so you had that list there of, of all the things you can now do at the end. Yeah. And these are really nice. Thank you. But when I look through the list, I, I don't see any of them being total energies, uh, ground state energies, or energy differences. Can you comment on, you know, for example, your energy differences must change as you change these parameters around? Have you looked at that at all to see? If so yes. So let me start with that. That is certainly an, an issue and a limitation. First of all, let's explain what the problem is. Suppose I have a, mo a diatomic molecule, say AB, that I want to break into atom A and atom B. And I want to calculate the dissociation energy. Just a standard thing that we always do, right? So now. If I calculate the optimal range separation parameter for the molecule AB, I'll get a number. If I calculate it for the atom A, I'll get a number. If I calculate it for the atom B, I will also get a number. But these three numbers may be different from each other. Which means that now subtracting them really doesn't make sense because it's like subtracting uh, energies from different functional streams. And you can think of it as a size consistency here. So this is definitely a limitation. What we have seen, however, is that if we freeze this range separation parameter at, at, at what we get from A, B, and then use it for A and B anyway, even though it's not optimal, it's usually not better than, say, a standard hybrid functional, but it's not worse either. So we're not, I'm not emphasizing it here because I can do reasonably well, but I'm not offering any improvement with respect to non-functionals. So, the, you know, it's the same. The one exception that we found to that, with 
paper on that from last year with, with a postdoc in the group, Samuel Jitsarkar, we looked at protonation and deprotonation energies of amino acids. Why? Because there people have found empirically that B half and half lip is actually a lot better than, than, than B lip or B3 lip. Why? Because they tried it and that's what they found, that it needs more exchange. So we did that with a range separated hybrid by freezing the gamma of the original amino acid and actually we get the right answer without the empiricism. Hard to say, we haven't done enough, so I, you know, I'm, I really don't want to say that this is a general conclusion. I'm not at all sure that it is, but at least in this case it offered me. That's a good note to close. Thank you. <laughs>